Hi, it's Jerry Roberts, and welcome to a special press clips edition of Newsmakers, where we talk to uh, local folks in the media about the big projects they're working on. It is Friday, April 15th. You still have three more days to file your taxes this year. Uh, but I want to welcome in um, Gwen Lurie, our friend from the Montecito Journal, editor-in-chief, and uh, Les Firestein, uh, who is the founder and editor of The Riv magazine, which we're going to be talking about today, the latest entrepreneurial uh, project of the uh, Montecito Journal Media Group, LLC. Uh, Les, of, uh, for those uh, unfamiliar, uh, is uh, well known in, uh, in Hollywood producer and writer, TV and movies, most notably in Living Color. Uh, as well as the Drew Carey show, and also the person who researched and found the uh, the design for the RingNet uh, project, uh, the award-winning RingNet project. So, uh, welcome uh, to both of you. And uh, oh, in full disclosure, they're married to each other too. So uh, there's that. Um, Les, I, I want to start with you. I, uh, I I went through the magazine uh, last night. Two hundred and ninety. Pages, if I got it right, that's nah, not going to look good. I think 292, something. 292 like that. pages. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I was, uh, there you go. Now, why can you do that? It doesn't look good on mine. Because uh, you have a different background, so it's uh, absorbed in the background. There you go. Okay. Um, you know, when I, when I was uh, putting a paper together every day up in San Francisco, you know, the only guidance I got was, you know, the paper should look every day like it was put together by a single intelligence. And, and I, th that sort of struck me about the magazine, Les. It really seemed to be, uh, I mean, you had a lot of the pieces, obviously, but uh, between that and your editor's note, I mean, it just re really felt like it was your magazine. Uh, what is The Riv and uh, why and why now? So we're very fortunate in that, as you know, Montecito is, is kind of blowing up. Uh, I mean that in a positive way. It's it's much more on everybody's radar. Um, I like I grew up in New York City in a very dark apartment. My mom was a decorator, and so I used to read all these magazines that kind of transported me to another place, and they were fascinating. And then I spent a lot of time in show business. At the same time, I was always building houses, and somewhere along the way, I felt like those magazines generally became uh, rather run of the mill and uninteresting. And so when Gwyn took ownership of the newspaper or led the group that took ownership, I said, you know, you should really do uh, architecture and design magazine for the American Riviera. And Gwyn said uh, to her credit, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? And I said, and well, Tim. Yeah, Tim <laughs> was right there too, yep. Yes, Gwen and Tim said, do that. And I said, okay, but you have to understand if I'm gonna do it, it's gonna have to be like with my attitude, which um, I guess has always been irreverent. You know, before I was at In Living Color, I was in National Lampoon. And to me, the most interesting stories were not necessarily the polished stories. They were like the bizarre stories and the insider stories. And I felt like there were just thousands of them waiting to be told. Hence, yeah. the riff. All right. Um, and then uh, um, your editor's note, which uh, starts on page 32 after 31 pages of hideously expensive real estate advertising. Um, well, first of all, you got this Anthony uh, Bourdain knockoff uh, picture uh, with the tats on, on your arms, I said. Well, well, what's that? Are those yours? Those there, are there are things that we do just to be entertaining. The uh, the dolls in the Cleric and Crane article just to be entertaining, just to be lively. Even if you look at our cover, uh, we hired Dewey Nix to take the photograph because I was like these. To me, the shelter mag magazines uh, have looked like insurance photos, like really nice insurance photos. But it's like, OK, that's what these people own. Um, and I'm fascinated by the people within the houses, not just the houses. And to me, I, I'm always telling photographers, make sure people are moving. Uh, don't hide the workers, stuff like that. So, you know, I think Gwen has always referred to it 
as a you know a look a peek behind the curtain. Yeah. And, you know, I spent so much time building. I'm also fascinated by that. You see a lot of that in the Bruce Heaven moonshot article. It's like, what was it like to build that place? Yeah. Well, and you 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 say that. Uh, I mean, actually, the editor's notes probably the most entertaining thing in the in the book that. Montecito, the Bitcoin you can live in, I thought was a pretty, uh, pretty Thank accurate you. thing. And, and yeah. also contrasting the rib with uh, what you call shelter porn um, mm -hmm. by Henry, by which I, I take it you mean architecture digest and, and, and so on. All of, yes, all of those things that, are, that, that read more like brochures to me. Yeah. Well, and there, I mean, to the extent there's content in most of these magazines, it's advertorial. It's not, um, you know, I think first and foremost, less if I could speak you know, for me. Oh, but about yeah. you for a second. I mean, has I that think, ever happened before? No, probably not. This is the first time, so I'm glad you're recording it. <laughs> um, less is, you know, he is, I think, first and foremost, a storyteller. And I think that is sort of been the attitude of the journal in general of let's, you know, I joke with you, Jerry, sometimes I say, you get it first, we get it better. <laughs> you know, well, we and, get right. you know, I think these are really interesting stories to tell. And I think Les was a storyteller in Hollywood. He's a storyteller when he helps someone design a home. And he's a storyteller in this magazine. Yeah, yeah. And it's a chock full of stories. I think 20 full length feature articles with, with photo spreads, all of them. Um, you, you, you referenced the, um, the magazine uh, Les as the impossible burger. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you mean by that? Well, that was my my theory was, and I think this sa it says this in the letter, um, that if you gave people something that was delicious, that delivered on all the things they expect from a shelter magazine, but it also had nutrients, they wouldn't spit it out. In fact, they might they might enjoy that. And so that's my feeling. Like, uh, you know, obviously anybody uh, writing bots could do a serviceable version of the Bruce Heaven piece um, or the Jeffrey Cleric, David Crane piece. I forget what the third one was that you said that you read. The Steve Jobs piece. Right, the Steve Jobs piece. That one's a little harder. That requires um, some, some research. Um, but um, I think there are just mu um, much more interesting nutrients. There are better vegetables to throw into the stew. Yeah, and and uh, images. several of them done in a Q and A format, which I found very uh, accessible, um, and pretty funny conversations. Some of them as well. Um, so, yeah, sometimes that's easier to read. And well, you know, that's well. First of all, so that's fun for me because I'm coming out of Hollywood, writing a lot of dialogue, but it's you know, the people I interview seem so relieved to tell these interesting stories that they that they've you know generally never been asked and then when they see we're kind of really going for it people really up their game and you know it's it's wonderful for me to have that kind of a conversation with Mark Appleton he's a really fun guy yeah and once you get him out of his blazer <laughs> well, let me ask you a couple of qu uh, questions yeah. on the on the business side I know Tim Buckley is uh, off gallivanting around uh, France but so you'll have to You'll I'll have, have to, to channel my inner you'll have to channel your Tim things. Um, there's a jaw dropping amount of advertising in this thing. And, and some of the ads, I mean, you know, there's a real estate firm, you know, that says, oh, four billion dollars sold in, in Montecito in 2021. I'm like, wow. Yeah, know. they're kind of middle of the pack. I average sales price, 5.8 billion. You know, here's a home for 33.5. Um, why do you think one of people wanted to be in it? And, and, you know, how did you go about corralling so much? Well, there's a, there was a couple of things. Number one, I think that we got more advertising from out of area than we've ever gotten on this magazine, much more buy-in from designers, architects, um, building firms and, um, you know, other aspects, you know, different aspects of building. Don't forget the hyperbaric oxygen therapist either. So. I have that appointment at noon. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, you know, so, so yes, we have a lot of real estate ads, which we're very grateful for, but we also, you know, we were really offering something new and something Tim wanted to do that I thought was very smart was to introduce the RIV, not as its own magazine the first time, even though it is clearly the RIV, it says brought to you by Montecito Journal Media, but, um, uh, you know, to offer, uh, to offer it as part of the quarterly glossy so that advertisers wouldn't see it as a brand new magazine because we had no proof of concept. So that was that was uh, very- Yeah, because you hard. also published Montecito uh, magazine. We published the Montecito Journal Glossy, the quarterly magazine. So we moved to four this year. So two of the four are the RIV this year. And then um, it may or may not break off as its own thing. Um, it is its own thing, but its own, you know, separate brand. And then Les has, and and the the team have all sorts of, um, you know, digital uh, podcasts, um, all sorts of plans to uh, expand this and for Les to be able to, on an ongoing basis, write about design and architecture. Yeah. And you are, of course, uh, the South Coast uh, uh, most... Uh, enterprising media impresario and entrepreneur. This is yet another revenue stream, I take it. Uh, what, I mean, it looks enormously complicated to have put this together. I, I mean, I do know that, you know, paper's hard to get these days sometimes. And, you know, this is full color, glossy, beautiful reproduction of the photographs. Uh, what was that process like? Do you, do you want to speak to that, Gwen? We can both speak to do, do you have uh... I mean, I know that there was part of it that was really, really tough. Everybody's hearing the supply chain stories, really hard to find the pulp at a certain part. And the, and the role I played is that I have an ex-girlfriend whose brother was in that business. And he turned out to be a critical hookup uh, in terms of getting us uh, a reasonable price on pulp because it's up, what, like 500% or something like that? Yeah, it's up. Yeah. No, it's not yeah. up 500%, but almost 300%. I mean, it's it's a lot. There were 25,000 copies of this magazine printed. 25,000 you know, was the press run? It's 292 pages, 60 pound glossy interior. I mean, it's expensive. It's a very expensive business to be in um, now. So we're trying to figure out, as everyone's trying to figure out, how to how to make money doing it. So, um, you know, uh, but, but we've- but You've been doing it with the newspaper to your credit in a, yeah. in a, in a time that, that uh, most print publications are struggling. Yeah, we have. I mean, it's been, it's been a good, it's been a good run. And, you know, without these hiccups and without these obstacles, we'd be doing excellent. But- yeah. uh, I'm going to take a wild guess and, and, and say, you know, it probably cost a quarter of a million dollars to produce this. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the advertising, I have no idea, but uh, did you net out on this one? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, 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 you're close. Okay. Well, that's, that's. We all did net out. We, we definitely netted out. Um, you know, a lot of our costs were a couple of years in the making. Uh, because of the development that went into this, this was not something we just no, obviously not. vomited out, um, you know, less and the team. And, you know, I do want to, um, you know, really thank also Trent Watanabe, our um, art director, art director, who yeah. is, you know, so, so talented. I mean, he's really an artist in his own right. And I think he and Les had a blast collaborating. I think, you know, the idea of doing something kind of outside the box was very exciting to him. And they kind of, they all, and Tim, they all really embraced the challenge and loved it. Uh, and, and tell me how, how you, uh, what was the distribution plan this time for the 25,000 copies? Uh, there, um, so I, I would say 15,000 are being sent to homes. Another 10,000 are going to be on racks. And, you know, as you can imagine, most of the advertisers in the book want copies of the book. Um, we're going to quickly, I know, Jerry, you enjoy immensely ribbing us for our, for our slow pace to get online after we publish something. Um, but we are trying to work out, Les, do you want to talk about sort of the plan for that? 
the uh, website you got a website coming yeah i mean what we have to do um you know for our advertisers is we have to let the print publication sit and be enjoyed by people for a couple of weeks and then uh kind of taking something a little bit out of tv and netflix which is to then we're going to start rolling out articles online kind of one by one uh starting in a couple of weeks with enhanced materials in those articles um so we're gonna we're gonna uh farm them out that way yeah podcast and the works too yeah the whole thing okay all right um Les, let me ask you uh, about some of the content uh yeah. montecito moonshot is the big headline on the cover right. and right. uh it's a fascinating story 30, 32 page layout um about um bruce heaven uh mm -hmm. spouse of uh, uh linda wyman of uh, lynda.com uh who is building a never in the history of santa barbara uh home uh and rarely in the country says the says the lead of the story talk about that that home and that story and and what's going on there it's extraordinary well yeah it is um he there's a guy who thinks outside the box <laughs> and uh you know it's it's in the article which is i think uh bruce was to linda what less is to gwen meaning there's this other person who's a big part of the picture uh but wasn't necessarily getting his credit and so uh linda and bruce together decided bruce should this would be his aria that he you know this was the thing he got to do his way and um you know he's a he's a He's a pretty brilliant guy and an uh, art center guy and a nerd. And he wanted to try doing all this stuff differently and invent a lot of new things along the way. And this is, you know, seven quick years later, this is what he has. Well, it was only <laughs> three years. Les, only... Les, are you likening this magazine to Bruce's house? Is there a parallel there? I think there is. I think they're both, I think they're both uh, outside the well, box. Well, I, I will say about Linda and Bruce, they really are partners. They built most of that company together. And, um, you know, it was it was called Linda.com. So everyone assumed it was just her company alone. And um, but they're they're an incredible team and both just brilliant artists and creative thinkers in their own right. So they were a pleasure to work with. You know, we've been working with them for two years, kind of helping document i mean bruce less you could talk to this but he's an amazing photographer and yeah. has documented this house every day of the designing and building of this house both with video and um still photography so there's i'm sure i know a documentary coming down yeah. the pike there is a documentary coming down yeah. the pike yeah. yeah it's called and it's called hill house uh mm -hmm. in part because i guess a lot of it's underground and the top yeah, is, uh, uh, green. What, they, what they did was uh, they kind of scalped the hill a little bit so that they could embed a lot of this house into the mountain. And then they built the house, which is a shell of concrete back where the hilltop once was. And then there's several feet of vegetation and dirt on top of this very strongly domed structure, hence hill house. Yeah. It is truly, they will be living inside of a piece of art. Um, and I will say this on your show, Jerry, maybe I can get them to allow me to bring you to show you around. You will be blown away. It's pretty incredible. Well, that would be good. That would be, you owe me. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Let me ask you about, uh, you, you got inside another place, uh, which is pretty amazing too, Aless. Uh, the home of uh, uh, David Crane and Jeffrey Clarick, uh, uh, creators of Friends, among other things. Uh, and uh, I loved the line from one of their mothers who said, "What this is what God would do if he had money." Um, talk, talk about that. Talk about well, that. Well, it's interesting. So, so uh, you know, we were working in show business. I mean, they're still working in show business. We were working at the same time. I didn't really come across them when I was uh, in show business. And um, we had these mutual friends who said, oh, you've got to get to Jeffrey and David's house. And I said, why? And they said, well, uh, I said, they said it had something to do with the, the garden. And I said, the, the garden? They said, well, it's really gardens. 
with an S. They said it's like uh, kind of like the gardens at, um, uh, you know, Wanda, no, at Wanda Lund, whatever her name is, uh, you know, at Lotus Land. They said Lotus it's like, Land. Yeah. That, you know, that, that it's like the, that it's a series of gardens, like a series of episodes. And they said, you just have to see it. And then I, you know, so they were kind enough to invite me over and it really is a series of episodes. You go from garden to garden to garden and there, there's kind of that illusion happening there that happens at Disney World and Disneyland that you don't really know where you're going and you can't really see where it ends, but you're having experience after experience and, and all of those experiences are good. And what's amazing about it is uh, Jeffrey Cleric, you know, he's an incredible writer and show creator. He was the landscape architect of his place. And did so I understand it right that, 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 that the, the property was, was badly damaged in the debris flow and they, this is all kind of from scratch? Yeah, it was overrun in the debris flow. So then it, it all got redone. I think they had something else there before. Um, and fortunately, as you know, um, you know, the oak trees, all the historic vegetation stayed um, and they and they uh, redid all the rest of it. And, you know, it's just it's a gorgeous, transformative experience. They happen to be the nicest guys in the world other than you. And, um, you know, it's a really fertile place um, for them to keep dreaming up shows. Well, you compare, you compared it to a Monet, I think. Uh, it is. At, it is at, at Monet. They compared it to Van Gogh, but that seemed too uh, self self harming. Yeah. yeah. And 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 Jeffrey and David created episodes together, right? They didn't create friends together. Although I'm sure, just like you and Bruce, Jeffrey was very involved in the background, and they've done a ton of stuff together over the years. They're both really talented. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, this other really interesting piece, um, of course, uh, George Washington Smith Homes, uh, it's just an integral part of our, where we live and uh, the, uh, I guess we can't say Spanish colonial, Spanish revival, I guess. Shouldn't say, yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how that works because it was Spanish colonial, meaning do you yes. want to erase the, or, you know, it, it was a colonization. I know. Did we say it wasn't the colonization? I don't um, know. That, I don't know if historical accuracy is a defensible position anymore. It's true. I, true. I, I always err on the other side. But yeah. Steve Jobs, uh, the late Steve Jobs, uh, creator of, or, of Apple or one of the founders of Apple, this really interesting story. Uh, he had a George Washington Smith house up in Woodside in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and unlike most people who are valued greatly, he wanted to tear it down, and he and he, and he fought this what decade long battle with the local yeah, a little more, uh, a little more local, than a decade, yeah, uh, to, to, to tear tear it down. He exactly. never got to enjoy it torn down. Did it basically on his deathbed? Yeah, yeah. and you interviewed Mark Appleton, who is yeah. the, uh, the the number one go to person about George Washington Smith here. Right. Um, uh, talk a little bit about that 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 it's, strange it's, narrative. Yeah, it's such a strange story because, you know, I mean, I guess uh, Steve was pretty young when he bought it because he was like a centimillionaire in his early 20s or something like that uh, because of Apple. And, the, and you know, he was living there like Diogenes, right? Like that he wanted to have no possessions. And there are these famous pictures of him that's just a Tiffany lamp and like, a yoga mat, right? And he didn't furnish the place and all that kind of thing. A $2 million so, dollar Tiffany lamp. Exactly. And a beer. <laughs> exactly, and a beer and a very expensive stereo. Um, so, you know, he was, I, I think it's well known what an odd guy he was and how many, I would call them like tormented forces or forces of torment were acting upon that individual. So he bought the place. I have my own theory about why he never furnished it, which is, you know, he was a guy who was returned twice or one and a half times as an adoptee, right? So I think he was always ready to leave or he was weirdly always waiting for the yoga mat to be pulled out from underneath him. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know that I wanna do a spoiler alert. I do have my own theory as to why he had to wreck that house, although, he speaks in a Stanford graduation speech about um, 
he believed that in order for certain things to be born, other things had to die. Which is kind of the, you know, Silicon Valley disruptors code in a way, you know, we exactly we have to. Exactly. Well, the, the, you know, there's a fa some fascinating stuff. This is, you know, what we call the extra material um, that's not in the article. So I don't really talk about the guy. The house was called the Jackling Mansion. And Jackling was a copper baron, which is a, a very filthy business in terms of how you mine you know, the carbon debt of carbon, of uh, copper mining and that kind of thing. But I'm gonna say fascinatingly, if that is a word, Jackling, because of uh, his, his copper baronage was known as the man who wired America. And Steve Jobs was kind of known as the man who unwired America or, or wirelessed America. So you can certainly see that force at work there. And he was a guy, I think, who thought in metaphor, like Jacqueline yeah. needs to go, and this needs to be known as the Steve Jobs place. Now, of course, there are a lot of people like Mark Appleton who go, why wasn't that the Silicon Valley Museum? I mean, you know, he wasn't wanting for funds, but, um, you know, there were a lot of forces acting upon Well, him. and he lived next door to Larry Ellison, too, so no doubt that there was, was a certain amount of jealousy there. <laughs> And uh, for our viewers who, who would uh, 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 doubt Les's uh, bona fides on this, he is, he is the son of a psychiatrist, so right. I think eligible to speak. Yeah, I can almost <laughs> prescribe medications. <laughs> I can say them for my dad. <laughs> well, you know, and the other thing is, I mentioned there's 20, 20 feature stories in it, and, you know, a lot of substance, um, obviously, along with the pretty pictures, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that really is surprising or surprised me in, in, in going through it was you have a piece on, on Mogadishu. And I think people I do not that. normally uh, yeah. associate Mogadishu with Riviera, but uh, there, is, there is a connection. I, I, so again, if you look at pictures that I have that will be in our bonus materials about Mogadishu, it looked like kind of a dead ringer for Santa Barbara only the water was a little nicer. This is all like, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And, uh, you know, originally I was researching a story on Benghazi because it had a lot of Italian architecture. And as the son of a psychiatrist, I had these questions and theories. Did the colonial architecture there create a context for conflict with the West? That was my question. That was turned out at that particular point in time to be too difficult a story to write. So I started looking around the area and I found that, um, you know, we all know Mogadishu from, uh, from Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down, yeah. But if you look at that, or even the video games of Black Hawk Down, you can see there's this incredible Ita Mediterranean Italian architecture. And you go, well, where did that come from? And it came from a, the Italian colonialization of East Africa. Um, which was really done largely by Mussolini. And, you know, to a certain extent, I mean, those stories are just so fascinating to me. But even more fascinating, you know, when you think your build, your building project is difficult, <laughs> you know? And I'm talking to these architects who are like, yeah, I was working on this thing, but uh, the client got blown up by a truck bomb. Um, you know, you just come across the most fascinating people who are enduring every day. And they're building stuff, you know, we build stuff here that might get, you know, rattled by an earthquake. Their stuff may be blown up by someone intentionally, but they're not gonna stop building it. You know, we, we do a pretty decent uh, profile of this woman, Ilwad Elman, who builds like rape crisis centers in Somalia, which is, which is not a very friendly environment to that kind of structure. And she's and she's well aware, like these may get blown up or shot up, but she her story is an amazing story. She's been nominated three times for a Nobel Peace Prize. Her dad started the Ilwad Peace The Elman Peace Center, yeah. Elman, yeah. El, Elman Peace Center um in Mogadishu. He was killed by the Taliban. Her not mother the Taliban. Someone, I'm not sure if it was the Taliban. I mean, I know. The uh, Taliban derivatives are still very active there. I'm not sure who was that. He was assassinated. He was assassinated. 
Um, her mother took her and her sister to Canada. She returned to finish the work of her father. Her sister was then assassinated. And she continues to work there to rebuild, works with children, runs an orphanage, um, you know, builds these rape crises. She's just a, an incredible young woman, 32 years old. Um, I had only been nominated. I had only been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize once at that age. Yeah, yeah, me really too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, we got to uh, wrap up. But um, uh, Gwen, the, the the key question, I guess, for me as an editor is, uh, how was Les about hitting his deadlines? So it was nice talking to you today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let, let me just say that in general, I could not be more proud of less than the entire staff. I, I'm just blown away by what they achieved. And, um, you know, I think deadlines are. Um, I burn the midnight oil, Jerry. All right. Uh, Gwen Lurie, editor in chief of the Montecito Journal. Les Firestein, editor and founder of the magazine we've been talking about, The Riv. Can people pick it up if they want to find it somewhere, or, or do they ha they have to just look in their mailbox the way I did? Is I it? Have, it's going to be in racks, right, Gwen? It's going to be in racks, so they could pick it up, get it. You know, a lot of people are getting it sent to their homes, and then people have homes outside the air area. We are making um, it available going forward for to subscribe to all four of the quarterly magazines to get it delivered out of area. So. We're trying to cover every which way. All right. All right. Well, thank you both for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you both for the work that you do holding up a mirror to our community and, and, and Mogadishu in the world. Um, and uh, good luck with the rest of the uh, uh, issues. <laughs> I hope they don't, I hope it doesn't turn into the, you know, to the, to the hill house of, uh, of media. But, uh, <laughs> Well, thank you for talking to us. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.